many of you know that before I was called to, uh, to the pastorate, uh, I was in business. And so I read a lot of business books. And uh, one of the books that I read was a, a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Perhaps you've read it. Uh, author Stephen R. Covey, a Mormon, we won't hold that against him. But uh, Stephen R. Covey tells, and he begins, and he tells this story of how he used to ride the subway to work. And that was his, his quiet time, his time of meditation. And, and he, he tells the story of one early morning where he was on the subway car, and he was by himself. And uh, the doors opened, and it came to a stop, and the doors opened, and on walked a father and five of, of his young children. And as he was sitting there, he, he tells the story of, of how the father went and sat and stared out the window of the car whilst the children ran all over the car, thumping the back of people's newspapers and, and, and hooting and hollering and making a, a great deal of a ruckus. And after a, a little bit of, of time, Covey tells how he went over to the father and he said, Sir, your children are unruly and they're disturbing everyone in, in the car. Will you please do something? And he said, I'll never forget how the father turned to me and in these sad eyes, he said, oh yes, I, I, I probably should do something. I'm sorry, I'm just a little distracted. We've just come from the hospital where their mother has just passed away. And he tells that story in the beginning because he, he gives a picture of, a, of what he called a paradigm shift. And if you think about the mindset of all of those people in the car and how, how upset they were with, the, with what was occurring in, in the car, but then coming to, having Covey come to realize that there was this life event in the lives of all of these people, it just changed his entire perspective on the circumstances. And so I tell this story this morning because I, I want us to understand that perhaps we need a paradigm shift about what church is. Perhaps we need to understand differently what, when we say church, our perception of church, is our perception of church what I would call spectator Christianity? To better understand what I'm talking about, if you will turn with me to the book of Genesis, as we continue our study in Genesis, Genesis if you can believe it, we're already in chapter 11. And so I'll begin reading in chapter 11, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 11. And uh, beginning in verse 1, it says this, Now the whole world had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come and let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen and mortar. Then they said, Come and let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we disper be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all of the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, we talked a little bit about this last week. All through chapter 10, we read about clans and languages. So we have to understand that chapter 11 is actually taking a step back in time from chapter 10. Uh, I explained to you how the Hebrew language is, it uses particularization. So it makes a very general statement and then it go back, goes back and fills in the details. And that's what we're seeing here this morning in chapter 11 is a filling in of some details. Now it's not really clear, if you look with me, whether the descendants of all three of Noah's sons are involved in this story. If we look and study the text, you can't really tell if Shem, Ham, and Japheth are, are all involved in this or if it's just Shem or, or whatever. So what we do notice, though, is the people settle in Shinar, in the land of Shinar. 
And most archaeological scholars connect the summer in, in the southern Mesopotamia, which is modern Iraq, just to give us some perspective on the geography of, of where we are with this. Another thing that leads us to this conclusion is that because, you see, in Israel and Egypt, there are lots of rocks uh, for construction. The text tells us here that people use fired bricks and pitch. And so if you were to go back and do an archaeological study, maybe you're a nerd like that I am, uh, going back and look at archaeology, they identify this technology to be prevalent in southern Mesopotamia around the 4th century B.C. So the events are tracking around, around 5,000 B.C., right around there. Next, uh, the text refers to this, uh, this city and, and a tower. And around this time in history, this kind of city would be uh, like public facilities and administrative buildings and so forth, and granaries and, and stuff that was connected to the temple. So what we're looking at here in chapter 11 of Genesis is a temple complex, this whole compound or around this tower that's being spoken of. So this brings us to the tower. An early Mesopotamian city had prominent buildings called a ziggurat. And so what's being explained here is, is a ziggurat, and, and the ziggurat kind of looks like a, uh, like a pyramid in design. A couple things about it. They look like a pyramid from the outside, but they have a completely different function. It's not hollow like the other pyramids that you may, may see over in, uh, in Egypt. They actually are just filled in with, with dirt inside. And ziggurats were dedicated to specific gods. There might be more than one. So if they had several gods, they'd build a ziggurat for each one of their, of their gods. Archaeologists have found actually that almost 30 of these are in the area that we're reading about today. So if you go over there, you would be able to see these over there now. So this is, you know, some people talk about the Bible and say, oh, that's a fairy tale, that's a, a fairy tale story. Well, you know, archaeology has done nothing but support anything that's written in the Bible. Everything that you see archaeologically supports what we read about in the Bible. So you can go over to that area today and see that. The main feature, though, was this stairway that led to the top of a small room. And this is very significant. That was why I'm sharing this. And it had like this bed and a table there for their God. You see, they're humanizing him. They're, they're, they're making him kind of with, with human qualities and human needs and, and human functionality. The most important function of a ziggurat is it's off limits to people. So it's not a place where the people would go up to the top there. It, that was off limits. Actually, the, the worship area was down at, at the bottom. And it was, you know, in essence, it was a, a stairway to heaven, you see, or a stairway from heaven, more likely. So at the bottom of the complex, that's where the temple was. So what we're reading about here is, is the temple building of this complex with, with a ziggurat. And in it, was, it was designed to make it easier for the gods to come down from the temple to get worship from everyone. As if God needs a stairway to come down from heaven, if you will. So what did they do wrong? Why is this a bad thing? What, you know, I mean, they're, they're acknowledging God. They're acknowledging that they need to worship God. What, what, did, what did they do wrong? Well, most people think it was pride. They read the text and they say, well, this was the pride of humanity. That's, that's why God was, was chastising them. That's why God separated them, because, because of their pride. Another thought is that the, the infraction was, was disobedience. I mean, God told them to be fruitful and multiply and, and, and fill the entire earth, right? But the text tells us that the people are congregating here and building this, this city uh, up, up to the clouds. So, you know, God told them to be fruitful and multiply, but, but this, was, this was a blessing. It wasn't a command. It was a, it was a blessing, for them to be, to be fruitful and multiply. And we saw that map from last week. You know, it was still in the ancient Near East there. The blessing was not by location, but by multiplication. So disobedience wasn't their sin either. So what was it? What was their sin? What did they, what did they do wrong? Well, you might have guessed that it's their concept of God. Their concept of God and who God is and, and, and God's qualities was the sin that they were committed. As, as we look at the Babylonian culture, their perception of deities was that they possessed human qualities. 
that their, their deities had arms and legs and a head and they ate and they had needs and that they needed the worship of, of, their, of their followers. They, they needed it. Of course, you may know one of, the, one of the unlimited qualities of God is he's self-sufficient. He needs nothing. He needs no one. He doesn't need you and I at all. He's, he's self-sufficient. So instead of man being created in God's image, what we have here is the reverse. Man is creating God in his image. Row, row. That's not a good thing. Not a good thing at all. So instead of people trying to be more godlike, they're, they're trying to bring God down to this level of fallen humanity. Humanity is creating this entity with needs and with weaknesses. So the, the offense here is in the beliefs that resulted not in the building of the city and the tower, but what stood in the minds of the builders and their perception of God. See? He's portrayed it as human with, with faults. This is called paganism, by the way. Paganism is applying, applying misinformation about who God is and, and this perception in our mind about, about God and who He is. But I'm not going to preach you, to you today about this fallen world. I mean, we're all, we're indwelled believers here. I know your hearts. I know, I know you. We're, we're indwelled believers here. And so I'm not going to talk about fallen world and sin and, and all of that. What I want to talk about, friends, is what we're doing here and why we do what we do. And I want us to consider us as Christians, as believers, as the body of Christ and, and what this is all about here. Why do we do what we do? Could this be our ziggurat? Could it, could it be that our perception of God is that we come here at 1030 and God comes down and his words filter, and I'll get out of the way because I'm not talking about me, that, that, that we, we come here to commune with God and God, God comes down here at 1030. And then at, at 1130, miraculously, he goes back up to heaven and off we go to our lives. I mean, look at how the room's arranged, right? I mean, here the, this, this looks like, the, here's the audience, right? And here's the stage and here are the performers, Right? I was talking Wednesday night about this just a bit. Uh, and perhaps you've been a, a part of, uh, of a Sunday school class or, or, or our house church. House church is, is really awesome because it's, it's outside the church building. And interestingly, there's a, there's a substantial amount more of, of, of interaction between the people that are, that are there at, at house church. And maybe, maybe you've been involved with that where you've got uh, a couple of Christians that go, hey, we're going to have a, a cookout over our house. Uh, we're going we're gonna to study a, a scripture passage. You know, and, they, and everybody comes over that, that's been invited and they, they grill hamburgers and hot dogs or, or whatever. And, uh, and then they sit around and talk about the Bible. And there's, there's, there's this interaction that goes on. It's just, it's just so much more substantial in, in essence because people are engaged, they're actively involved. And I'm going to tell you right now, you all know I was called to ministry later in life to, uh, to, to be a pastor. And so I've sat right where you've sat. And I've sat there skiing in Aspen or considering whether I was going to go to Luby's or whether I was going to go to Burger King for, for lunch. And, and at the end of the service, I, I couldn't tell you what the sermon was about. I've been there. I, I, I get it. I get it. You know what? Those things happen to us. They do. But what I want us to consider, friends, is you know, when, and, and I call this in, in, I, I, as, a, as a, a leadership trainer and, and as a motivator. I've talked to people about what I call the shower test. You know, and, and the shower test is this. You're, you wake up and you're, you get in the shower and you're, you're getting ready and everything. What are you thinking about? You're thinking about your day and how's your day going to go and your purpose. So on Sunday morning... When you're getting ready for church, what are you, what are you thinking about? What are you, why are you coming here? What's, what's the reason why we commune on a Sunday morning? What's the reason why, after a long, hard day at, at work, that you drive all the way out here to Brazzaville Baptist Church for a Wednesday night Bible study? Or why do you get up earlier 
to, to go to Sunday school? Or why do you get up 15 minutes earlier in the morning every day to do your daily quiet time? What's the, what's the purpose? What's the reason? And what's your perception of God and, and how He interacts with that and interacts with you? <clears throat> And so our takeaway for this very interesting passage, you know, maybe you've never heard this passage preached this way. You know, people talk about the pride of humanity or the disobedience of humanity, but they never talk about the fact that this was really all about people's perception of God and our relationship with God. When I was a kid, I, I went to uh, some concerts. So you, uh, I'll, just, I'll just share with you. Yeah, I, as a kid, I went to some concerts. Maybe you've been to concerts, and you go to see a certain band at these, at these concerts, right? But there's a warm-up band, and the warm-up band is usually a band that you don't know as well. Maybe you've never heard of them before. You know, you're sitting there in your seat in the, you know, in the concert, and you're listening to this warm-up band, and sometimes it's like, you know what, when, when's the headliner coming? You know, other times it's like, wow, these guys, these guys are really amazing. I remember I went to see, uh, one time, uh, we, we really liked the police. When, when I, yeah, that's how old I am, yeah. And, and, and there was this really unknown band that warmed up for the police called R.E.M. <laughs> and I was like, wow, these guys are really good, you know. So you know what, you know what? When, when that happens, what do you do? You go, you know what, hey, let's go, let's go look up and let's buy a couple of their albums, right? Never heard of them. And now all of a sudden, it's like, wow, this is really something there. And then you go, you go buy a couple of our albums, you get more familiar with them, right? Get a little bit more familiar with them. And then you might even go to a, a concert as, as, as them with a headliner. Now you really know R.E.M., don't you? No, you don't. You know their music. You don't hang out with them, right? Another band that, uh, you know, that, that we listened to uh, when I was a kid was, it was Kansas. Interestingly, when, when I, when I uh, moved to Atlanta, Georgia, my very close friend and the owner of our company went to this church called Perimeter Church. And guess what? You know who the music director was? Carrie Liftgren of Kansas. <laughs> so I got to meet him. And all their, all their guys in the band there, they go to this church. And it's so funny because they're driving around in these minivans and they got these little kids in the car seats and everything. And I'm like, that is not my perception of this, of this band. Why? Because I got to know them personally, instead of just knowing, knowing their music. And, and I, I explain this this way, friends, because is it that way about God for us? Do we just know a little bit about Him? Did we, did we, did we come, come to church and say, wow, this is really interesting, I'm a, I, I, want, I want more, and then you know, we just we read a little bit more about Him, we study a little bit more about Him, or do we know Him? Are we, are we intimately in, in a relationship with God? Or have we made Christianity a spectator sport? Are we just doing this because it's just kind of the way church is? Because, well, you know, I grew up in church, so this is kind of what we do. Are we really kingdom-minded about our intentionality, about who we are and whose we are? Over in uh, 1 Peter, kind of explains who we are. Chapter 4, 1 Peter, in, uh, in verse 9, chapter 4, verse 9, begins to talk about us when he writes, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Ooh. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. You know, there are a lot of one another passages in the Bible. You know who it's talking about? Us. When it says one another, it's always talking about the body. It's always talking about Christians. It's always talking about us together. So when it talks about one another, serving one another. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Now that word, that word in the Greek is oikobos. And it's the word for stewardship, but it's also the word for to dispense. In other words, if I, if I go to the doctor and the doctor gives me a prescription and I go to the pharmacist, he will dispense that medication to me. 
And so the dispensing of things is a stewardship that you and I have been given. What's the stewardship that we've been given? Gifts. What's the purpose? To serve one another. You see that? As each has received a gift, verse 10, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. You notice it says varied. And in another place, it says to each of us is given a measure, a measure of faith. In other words, we haven't been given all the same measure. It's different measurements of it. So it's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength of God, supplies in order that everything, in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. So I'll back up there just to give you the, the exegesis of that as well. It's explained, whoever speaks, one who speaks, oracles of God, and whoever serves as one who serves by the strength of God. In order that, okay, there's our purpose. Whether we're teaching or whether we're serving, the purpose is that in everything, and, and if we go back to the Greek, everything still means everything. That means it doesn't matter where. You know, we think, we, we, we kind of compartmentalize, particularly men, we'll compartmentalize the church, right, as like church. And we had a, we, we had a work day, and then it got canceled, and, and then it wasn't canceled. Uh, and, and we got people that came over and pressure washed and, you know, and planted flowers and pulled weeds. And of course, you know, this is, this, these are things that, that, that we need to do. But, but as, as we look at that, that's not church. All right? That, that we need to be good stewards of our building. We need to keep it up. Absolutely. But that's not church. You know, digging post holes and, and, and pressure washing isn't church. You know what church is? This is church. We're coming together. We're worshiping together as the body of Christ. But it's so that, right? In everything. God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Why? Because to Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so whether we're at work, whether we're hanging out with our friends, whether we're watching the game, whether we're, we're hanging out with our kids, whether we're going out to dinner, everything, whatever it is we do in our lives, friends, that is being the body. You know, when we talk about, when, when pastors start talking about service and all of these things, you know, people kind of scooch their toes back because they don't want, want us to step on their, their toes. This is not toe step. This is, this is freeing and enablement, friends, because it's exciting. It's exciting that you don't have to be changing diapers over, over in the nursery or pressure washing the, the sidewalks to be being the body. You can be the body wherever you are doing whatever you do. It's just a matter of shifting the paradigm of why you do it and the purpose, you know, that, that shower test in the morning of why, why am I getting ready to go to work? Well, yeah, I need sustenance. I need, I, need, I need to pay my bills, absolutely. But there are people that are in my life that need to see the truth of salvation by faith in Christ. And God has placed you in, the, in those circumstances so that you can go and be and do as the body of Christ. And it's my role friends, and I would, I would be doing a great disservice to you if I did not share the truth of that with you and our purpose and who we are. This is our role. I must help us discover our gift and use it in the body. The health is, of the body is, is our goal. I mean, back to the doctor illustration, if I, was to go, if, if I was to go to the doctor and the doctor would give me, all, you know, take some blood and and, and look me over and x-ray me and then come back and, and say, I've given you every test that I can think of, Mr. Brooks, and I have bad news. Only 20% of your body is working. Only 20% of your body is functioning. Well, if that were true, I'd be dead. I'd be dead. What's our goal? It isn't, it, hopefully, it, all of our goal is I want 100% of my body functioning exactly the way that it's designed to function. It's no different. Each of us has been given a, a, a measured bit of grace and a gift to function together as the body of Christ, to work together to, for, the, for the furtherment of, of the kingdom of God. Living for Jesus should be the norm. We don't just know, we do. You know, and you have to catch yourself, particularly, you know, as, as, as a, a, an older person going back to school, 
it was very easy to slip in, you know, as I, as I was sitting there in 270 credit hours of theology and Bible study to make it all about academia and about learning. Because I like to learn. I'm a learner. I mean, that's, that's one, of, one of the things that I, that I enjoy most is, is learning. And I learn by doing. I'm a kinesthetic learner, very much like my younger son is. I love to learn. And every once in a while, I have to go, oh, oh. This is not about academia. This is not about making sure I get straight A pluses. This is about growing closer to the Lord and functioning and, and learning how I can better function as a servant of God plugged into the body of Christ. You know, for, as I read in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, in that chapter, chapter 4, verse 10, it talks about that we all have gifts. We've all been gifted in specific ways. And you know what? It's so beautiful to see, even the size of our church, 60, 80, uh, in a, on, a, on a great day, that everything seems to function. Everything seems to seamlessly happen. And rarely are we in a situation where we're wanting of, of anything because things just, they just happen. They happen. You see that how God does that. But I'll tell you this. If all we do every week is just show up here for the sermon and that it's just a knowledge assimilation, we missed it. We missed it. Christianity is not knowledge without action. This creates very unhealthy purveyors of the message. And so I want to keep us in check there. And if that's a paradigm shift, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah. I have a dream where every single member of the body of, of, of believers here at Brazos Main Baptist Church knows their gifting and is fully functioning in that gifting. Lofty as that sounds. I mean, you look at, you look at most churches, you know, people kind of chuckle about it, though. They say, well, you know, it's the 80-20 rule. You know what that is, right? You know, 20% of the people do 80% of, of, of the functioning in, in any organization, whether it's a church or a business or, or what have you. May it never be, may it never be that we do that. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, you don't need to go there. You can write it down if you want. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it talks about that we have a manifest gift given to each person. Very interesting. When you look at that word manifest, if something's manifested, you know what it is? It's visible. It's seen. It's, it's not something that, that's just inherently in there. It's actually visible. In other words, you can see it. And you know what the thing is, friends? Whether, whether we're using our gifting for the kingdom or not, it is manifest. Because wherever your passion is, that's where your gifting is. Whatever just really, really jazzes you, what gets you excited, just gets you so incredibly excited and overwhelmingly passionate, that's your gifting. So when we're using it in, in that way, friends, for the kingdom, it doesn't feel like effort. It doesn't feel like sacrifice. It doesn't feel like work. It's joy. It's joy. Over in Romans chapter 12, you can go there with me if you'd like. In Romans 12, perhaps you'll recognize, beginning in verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. There's that one another again. Did you know we're, we belong to each other? We belong to each other. We're, we're all parts of the whole. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. There's that measure of faith again. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith. If service in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Praise God. Praise God. Moreover, in Ephesians chapter 4,
And beginning in verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one. Hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that, purpose statement, we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine and human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint which is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I can do a whole sermon series on that. I think you get the gist of it though, guys. Each one of us has a function. Each one of us is connected to each other to function together so that when we all do it, it's just the symphony. Maybe you enjoy going to the symphony and, and, and listening and trying to pick out all the parts. You know, as a musician, I just really love going and seeing live performance like that and just appreciating, see if I can pluck out, you know, the woodwinds and see and hear all the nuances of the woodwinds or the strings or the brass and, and all that goes together with that. But when it's all pulled together and it's, and it's directed by, by that conductor in the right way, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. And that's you and I, friends. As the local body of believers, that's you and I. What a blessing. What a blessing. You know, the American perception of church really destroys that. It's a spectator Christianity that many of us have been indoctrinated to. Maybe you know some folks. But God intends us to use our gifts. Somehow Christians have allowed it to be acceptable just, just to call ourselves followers of Christ. But you know what really we are? We're fans. You know, back, back to the, uh, you know, going to, going to the concert, you know, that example, you know, we're just, we're, we're fans. Just like we're fans of, uh, of, of musical groups that, that, we, that we enjoy. I mean, we're not up there on, on stage with them, performing with them, right? We're just fans. We're, we're enjoying them and, and drawing upon them. You know, over in 1 Peter, as I read in verse 11, it talks about speaking the, or the oracles from God. I'm a player coach. That's my role. I'm, I'm leading by example. I'm in the game along, along with you, but I'm, but I'm a coach. You know, the, the, the coach brings, brings the team together, right? The, the, the coach motivates the team. The coach plugs the players into their, their right roles. He helps them to cultivate and develop their, their abilities and their skills and that they function together with other, the other team members. And you have that successful season when they're all performing at peak performance and doing what they're called to do in, in their roles and they're, and, they're, and they're properly motivated to, to do it. And, and I'm a player coach. We are to be ordinary people. Doing extraordinary things. Have you ever have you ever looked at something that that God did, and you just looked at that, and you're like, you know, I was I was there, but that was way beyond anything that I was capable of. And that's that's a prayer that I give. You know, let, let us do things that are completely disproportionate to who we are, so that we know, Lord, that you did it, that you did it. What a blessing! What a blessing! You know, that it, the Apostle Paul writes that. He's talking about the maturity and the health and the multiplication that, that, that comes as a, as a result of that, friends. 
You know, and as, as, we, as we grow up and, and mature, we were talking about this on Wednesday, you know, that you've got folks and they just got saved and, and we call them uh, what the Bible calls them baby Christians. You know, and, then, and as, they, as they mature in the faith, you become more spiritually mature. Just because you become more knowledgeable about the Bible, that doesn't make you more spiritually mature. You know, but we, we, we become more spiritually mature as we, as we grow up in, in our faith and as we grow closer in relationship with the Lord. One of the things that I, that I mentioned on, on Wednesday is the, the, the danger of the uh, adolescent Christian, right? Ad, adolescence, right? Anybody got any adolescents in your house? God help you. All right? But we remember them, right? Maybe we got some grandkids that are adolescents. What? They know everything. Right? You can't tell them anything. You know, and, and Samuel Clemens, right? Mark Twain said, you know, when I was 18 years old, I thought my dad was the dumbest man on the planet. But you know, it's really amazing how much he learned in just a, a couple of years. And by the time I was 25, he was the smartest man I knew. You know, so, you know, let's, let's, let's grow up in the faith and let's mature in the faith and grow closer to the Lord, that's what it's all about, friends, is, is that, that maturity and that, and that growing closer in relationship with the Lord. And the functionality comes as a matter of an outpouring of joy from our hearts. You know, when we say the joy of the Lord, our strength, are we, do we mean it? You know, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Hallelujah. Praise God, right? No. Maybe you've heard that phrase, you know, choose joy. I think that's a misnomer. You have joy. Just recognize it. It's not a matter of choosing joy. You already have it. It's just a matter of recognizing that you have it. The joy of the Lord. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. So having this philosophy of serving others, equipping, equipping, maturing, connecting at the right place, and just being released to do it. We need to act as if we're infected. You know, if I have a cold, if I have a really, really bad cold, you're going to know it. And perhaps you know that all of us have the cold virus that resides in us. But most of the time, it's just suppressed. You don't know it. But when it, when it becomes prominent, when I get that sore throat and that cough and that runny nose and the sneezing, pretty evident I got a cold. Right? Are we infected with the Lord Jesus Christ? You bet we are. We're saved. Irrevocably saved. Saved by grace. Nothing that we did to get it, nothing we can do to lose it. Praise God for that. But how are our symptoms? How are our symptoms? We here at Brazos Bend Baptist Church know this. We know everything that I'm saying. You could wag your head and say, I know, I know. But let me ask you this. How many people do you know that don't know. How many people do we know when you talk to them and say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Really, where do you go to church? Well, I don't really go to church right now. We're just kind of looking. You know, oh, yeah, we go. And you, you just, you just kind of kind of get a, get a sense of, is there this, this perception of God that's just a spectator thing where, you know, you just go to church and you're good, Right? I mean, we, we cross the finish line right here. I joke about that a lot. You know, of course, that's not really the finish line, is it? Right? I mean, the, the outward, outward expression of the inward change is something that we are commanded to do. And I don't want to belabor that. I don't want to bemoan that in any way. All right? Standing up here and saying, I believe the salvation by faith in Christ alone is a public profession of faith as much as, as, as being dunked in here. You know, baptizo to immerse. It's, those are outward expressions of a change that, 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 that's already occurred, friends. I don't want to belabor it too much, but I want us to, to consider, do I need a paradigm shift about my perception of God? 
Do I need a paradigm shift about my perception of what church is? And if I make that, if I make that shift, if I'm able to make the, make the transition, will it alter just how joyful that I feel every moment? When my eyes pop open, when that alarm goes off in the morning, hallelujah, the joy of the Lord is, is my strength, or is it, ah, reset the alarm, right? Another day, another day in the Lord. What an exciting time we live in, friends. And if there is not, if you don't see this as an opportunity, I mean, some of the darkest times in, in history are where the revival has come at the greatest time. The greatest need is at the darkest hour. It looks pretty bad right now, doesn't it? <coughs> but we're the church and dwell with the Holy Spirit empowered by the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is nothing, nothing that he can't do. Nothing. But we got to be equipped, right? We got to be ready. Church is a fulfillment of our mission. So think about those people in your lives. Think about them. Who, instead of behaving like they're created in God's image, they begin to, to view people themselves as, as God being in, in their image. And I want, I want us to consider this because this, 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 this is really an issue with people in our lives, friends. Because if you ask most people, they believe in God. But what's their perception of God? What's their perception of the church? Is it in line with the Bible? And if it isn't, how can we help them? How can we help them align with it? That's, that's our calling, friends. I mean, at, at the end of the day, that is what we're all about. Otherwise, God would have just snapped us up. The moment that you and I got, got indwelled with the Spirit, the moment that He ripped that sin nature out of you and replaced it with a new nature, He would have just caught, caught you up in the air right then. Why did He leave you here? Because you are to be an influencer of others. We are to reach the lost but we're also to reach folks that acknowledge the existence of God but have a misperception of them and give them, give them the right perception. And so that's my challenge for you this week, friends. In your daily lives, in our daily quiet time, I want you to isolate faces of people in your life, wherever they are in their, in their understanding, their perception of God, and pray that God would allow you to be light in a dark place. Will you do it? Let's pray.